So this is the first part in a series of videos where I build my Raspberry Pi Kubernetes cluster home lab. I've bought a couple of Raspberry Pis, a switch, uh, and I've, I've kind of diagrammed what I want to do with it. So I'm going to be setting it all up, setting up the Kubernetes cluster, and documenting it. I'm going to be, uh, I know a little bit of, of what I'm doing, but I'm going to kind of be documenting it as I go. Um, and I'll go into the hardware after we go into the design. So this is kind of what I came up with after I did a couple courses, uh, Kubernetes the hard way on Linux Academy, uh, by far the best course if you're trying to get Kubernetes certified, which I am not yet. Um, but they gave me a lot of ideas for, for instance, the NGINX health monitor. Um, I didn't even think about that before that course, really good. Um, but this is what I've kind of documented for the design. So I bought six Raspberry Pis, one, two, three, four, five, six. I have a VM sitting on my Windows PC. And for my worker nodes, I'm gonna be installing on all of them, the container runtime, container D, because Kubernetes has said uh, they're gonna deprecate Docker. Um, so I'd rather not have to do a bunch of work and migrate later and just use container D now. Otherwise I would install Docker. kubectl, the command line for Kubernetes, I'm going to have kubeadm for bootstrapping the cluster, the kubelet for the workers, it's the worker node service, and the kube proxy on all the worker nodes, which maintains the network rules. For the master, again, I'm going to have the kubectl command line, kubeadm for bootstrapping, but in addition, I'm going to have the nginx uh, for health monitoring. And then others here, we have a load balancer. Um, this isn't going to be utilized until I actually get a second master to load balance between the two masters so i will load balance between this api and another api in a second master i'm going to have an nfs server up here in the top and what that's going to be for is storing files throughout the cluster and also i want to use it as my physical volume store um, so i'm not mounting you know pods here in this worker pods here in this worker pods here in this worker because of the pod um, gets torn down and gets turned back up in another uh, bare metal host it's not gonna you know that data is not gonna be mounted uh, on that host so I want to kind of mount it all uh, in a kind of a remote share I've got a TFTP server uh, and this is for my own use later you don't have to install this but uh, I like to play around with pixie booting and kickstarting uh, Linux machines and I'm gonna have a VM which again, I'm gonna manage the cluster from outside the VM um, because I have Ansible and Visual Studio and everything set up there already. Um, so that's, I'm gonna be SSH into the cluster and managing most of it from there. So for hardware, I've got these Raspberry Pi 4s, Model Bs. I've got six of them. I have three eight gigabit models and three four gigabit models. The 8 gigabits will uh, go towards the Kubernetes workers to handle the application workloads. Uh, I've got a micro tick switch manufactured in Latvia. It was about $140. I'll use this to tie all these together. Uh, I've got a bunch of sand disks that I need to format with the operating system. In this case, it's going to be Ubuntu. I bought a memory card reader. This is how I'm going to plug these into my computer to format these sand disks. I've got a keyboard and HDMI to USB-C if I need to hook these up standalone to a display uh, and manage them through a terminal and not through SSH. I've got a bunch of Ethernet cords, one foot to tie these together with the switch. And I've got a bunch of, uh, well I've got two acrylic cases that hold three Raspberry Pis each. Once I put that together, they'll all be stacked. I've got this APC power supply that I'm plugging five of the Raspberry Pis into. Unfortunately, they don't all fit. So I've had to improvise and break out this old surge protector. Then I'm gonna plug one Raspberry Pi and the switch into for now. Overall, the, all this was about $600 total. So I went ahead and assembled the acrylic Raspberry Pi holders, um, three in each, and I went ahead and hooked them all up to the switch. 
So I plugged the switch in. So I'm gonna go ahead and configure that real quick. And then I'm also going to format these SD cards, these sand disks with the operating system we want. And then once that's done, I'll plug them all in and I'll power this on. I'll plug the keyboard in and then I have them hooked up as well to HDMI display. So let's get to formatting these cards. So Ubuntu has a really nice page for installing their operating system on a Raspberry Pi on an ARM64 architecture. So I'll link that in the description. But I'm basically going to be using this. Um, they have a follow our desktop and server tutorials. I'm going to be going through the server tutorial because you guys are learning with me. Um, and they have a bunch. Of, they have three different ver options you can choose from. You have server, uh, server development, uh, and desktop. And they explain the difference between desktop and server down here. Basically, server is just the CLI. It doesn't come with all the extra stuff that desktop does. It frees up resources that are precious on a, a small Raspberry Pi. Uh, so I'm actually going to go to the server tutorial and I'm going to run through this. Um, so it says we have um, two setup methods. Uh, you can use an HDMI screen and a USB keyboard, which I have, or we can do headless. So my micro SD card is plugged into the USB micro SD card reader now. Uh, it says I need to install the right Raspberry Pi imager for my operating system. So I'm on Windows. So I'm going to install that. So now the imager is installed. Um, so now we can move on to the next step, which is to choose OS. And we're going to click Ubuntu. And we want Ubuntu server TLS 32-bit, 64-bit. It's important to remember that bit. And you will be... Da, 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 da. Then it says open the SD card menu. So choose SD. And there's the one I plugged in, a 64 gigabit. And finally, write. Wait for the magic to happen, apparently. So once that's done, we'll continue. All right, so the image has been written and I timed it. It took about 10 minutes. So the next step, it says Wi Fi or Ethernet. Um, two ways to connect your Pi to the internet. Um, if you connect your Pi with your router and an ethernet cable, you can skip this step. This is only for Wi-Fi. So since I have the switch hooked up and I'm going to land going, um, this step is not going to apply to me. Um, but now it wants me to boot it. So I've got to go plug the SD card in, get an IP address, and attempt to SSH into that, I guess. So let's go try it. So as you can see from these pictures, I've hooked up the MicroTik switch port one to my Asus router at home via ethernet cable. And the directions on the MicroTik uh, documentation say to go to 192.168.88.1. Uh, However, um, this doesn't work because I have, because I hooked the switch up direct to my router, it's assigning the router a DHCP address. So if I go to MicroTik over here and I go to system, now let me just scroll this over here. You'll see that it says static IP address 192.168.88.1, but it also says DHCP with fallback. So it's using DHCP if it's available first, um, and then if not, then it'll fall back to this address. So if I attempt to connect to this address, it's actually not going to connect at all. So if I come over here to my Asus router, actually, um, I can see my micro tick here at the bottom of this list. Uh, and it's 192.168.50.226. So I typed that into my web browser over here. Uh, you can see up here. Um, and now I'm connected to the switch. Um, so what's going to happen is when I plug in, what should happen is when I plug in uh, the Ubuntu systems and the operating system installed, they should be set up for DHCP. Um, and just an example, I've already got one plugged in over here on port 20 and it says link on and it, it's going to be given an IP address based off the DHCP LAN uh, from my router. So it'll be in the same LAN as everything else on my network. So the next step, once you have the operating system installed and the micro SD card in the Raspberry Pi is to connect and you can do that through HDMI and USB keyboard, which I also have set up next to me. 
uh, or a terminal session. Um, but in order to do a terminal session, you need an IP address, and to get an IP address, you need to arc, well, you need to find what the MAC address is by doing arc command. So they have some arc commands here to do depending on what operating system and what version of Raspberry Pi 4 you're on. Um, so actually the ARP isn't working for me for whatever reason on my Windows PC. But when I do go over to my router here and I view my list of devices, I do have my Ubuntu uh, Raspberry Pi here with a DHCP address and its MAC address. Um, so that's how I'm going to figure out the IP address in order to SSH in. So now that I know the IP address, what I can do is for my Windows machine or another machine on the network, I can go ahead and SSH uh, Ubuntu user at the address, which I know was 192.168.1.13 uh, from that router page. And now I'm in. Uh, so let me just make sure I can reach out to a network here successfully. And I can. Um, and if you're wondering, um, how to set static versus DHCP. I'll link a guide in the description. I'll probably set these to static later, just so there's, there's no issues with the Kubernetes cluster, cluster when it's up and running. Um, but you're gonna go into Etsy net plan directory on Ubuntu, and you'll see, you'll probably see a 50 cloud init file uh, .yaml and that's it. Um, so I got rid of that, took it out of the equation. I just created a 99e0.yaml for my e0 interface. And I was playing around with static addresses earlier, um, but if you want DHCP, all you need is the interface, DHCP4, yes, and the version here has two. And then it should, if you make any changes, you'll just run a, a sudo netplan apply, and that'll apply any changes you make to an interface. Um, and so I'm going to go do that to all my Raspberry Pis now, and I'll be back. So that's going to be it for this first part video. In the next video, I'm going to uh, be installing the basic software we need to get the cluster up and running, creating the certificate authority, installing the certificates, and then uh, creating any Ansible playbooks I need to make this uh, process repeatable. And I'll push those to GitHub and I'll share them.